the happiest times of my life as always when I was coaching and being in the gym. Jackie Chan and Jet Li was a big influence for sure, right? One of the first things I did in my life when I was a kid, would you think that you're going to be next to world leaders? I'm not a person who knows a lot about many things, but when it comes to combat sports, when it comes to sports, that is the only thing I would say I know when you're, if you're nobody, really nobody, satisfied with it also. Yes! Oh my God, don't remind me. Try to find a solution. So everybody knew that I, I was good at striking, you know? They, Rio, again, pleasure to meet you. Uh, thank you for being here. It's always been something that, uh, for me, uh, Hawks Corner is something different. It's not a show for me specifically, but it's more of uh, a personal thing that I want to have conversation with experts like yourselves, who's been in the industry. We've grown up in the MMA world, but uh, I'm a little jealous of your journey because of uh, this is something that from childhood I had a dream of living the martial arts life, uh, travel, train uh, with some of the best masters in the world. And uh, you have done a lot that I it's, it's even hard to remember the amount of achievements you've had. If you could just go through uh, everything outside. Everybody knows you as MMA All Out, uh, the MMA media guy, the voice of mixed martial art in Middle East. But uh, let everybody in the Brave Nation and Hawks Corner know the martial arts lifestyle and the martial arts achievements you have. Um, well, I started to, I got beaten up in, in Dubai a long time ago. And... Um, I, I wanted to find a way, like, how can I even the odds, you know? And somebody mm. told me martial arts and stuff. So I started studying martial arts at like 16 years old. And um, as I progressed, I got my black belt in Tong Sudo in the States. I uh, uh, got uh, up to seven done, you know, grandmaster level. Mm -hmm. I got uh, uh, Hapkido under uh, John Pellegrini, uh, mainly because I wanted to know the grabs and how to do. I ended up teaching the LAPD, the, the police department in Los Angeles, wow. the officers. Uh, then I noticed that there's a, a flaw. When you grab someone, you go fall on the floor and stuff. So I ended up learning jiu-jitsu and I trained under Jean-Jacques Machado, uh, Carlson Gracie, and recently I have a brown belt under Hoyce Gracie, who asked me to go start all over just to go with him. Um, then I noticed that the flaw in, in the jiu-jitsu is the multiple attackers, with the, which is the taekwondo and, and Tang so will take care of. And uh, But I noticed that uh, the knives, and the sticks are is that's a big flaw. So I started uh, working with the late Remy Priestess uh, for stick fighting, and ended up getting my black belts in that. Uh, in the process, I got my Taekwondo when I switched from Montreal to um, uh, to to Los Angeles. There was no Tang the school, so I had to train in Taekwondo, and I achieved up to six done in Taekwondo. Amazing. That being said, the journey took me all over the world. I trained in uh, in Korea. I trained in Canada. I trained, of course, in the U.S. I met the likes of uh, Steven Seagal. Uh, uh, Van Damme, uh, Chuck Norris, the old guys, and the most recent guys. I've had the pleasure of uh, meeting Hamzat from Brave, uh, Habib, uh, Hoyce Gracie being a personal friend. Sure. Uh, you know, it ended up being Benil Dariush. At any point, I can call him and talk to him uh, about his fights. So I established that relationship with the fighters, the trainers, the legends, mainly because of the love of martial arts. Right. You know, every, everyone goes every morning to work. I never go to work. Mm. You know, people don't know maybe this. I have a electrical engineering degree and computer science degree. I finished my MBA and I have PhD in marketing. But I, you know, at one point, my highest level, I was the, uh, the CEO or the managing director for Forbes magazine. Um, uh, I worked for Intel. I worked for other companies, but my passion was martial arts. And my dad, God rest his soul, he said, do what you love after doing what you're supposed to do. So I got my degrees. I satisfied that part. Now I'm doing what I, what I love. And I never worked a day in my life because I go to work willing to do it for free. True. But I never do it for free. <laughs> no, amazing. It's a true uh, a life of a true martial artist. Uh, do you still get time to uh, train one? And do you, if you do get time to train, do you get time to uh, revisit each of those disciplines that you've been a uh, grandmaster of? A hundred percent. I also own the, one of the oldest, if not the oldest martial arts center in Dubai on Sheikh Zayed Road, World Black Belt Center. Uh, it started, uh, I owned uh, Tarzana Karate, which belonged to Chuck Norris, then uh, Dennis Hitchcock after them in the States. So when I came in to Dubai, I opened the World Black Belt Center and it's still the same place with the same same place in 19, for 1920 years now, 21 years we're gonna enter. Wow. Um, all the martial arts centers, I don't wanna say all, majority of the MMA centers started, like uh, Tam Khan he used to, actually used to work for me. Uh, I mean, uh, Tuati, who was the first uh, black belt in jiu-jitsu under Hoyce Gracie, he used to train with me. Uh, Ghalia, the first female black belt in jiu-jitsu, used to train with me. Thabit, uh, who was uh, entropy martial arts, 
work with me. Um, almost like I can say there's eight to nine martial arts centers currently in Dubai. They started, in, including the Nogueras. It was used to be called uh, Emirates BJJ. Mm -hmm. All the students, we were the first people to bring BJJ to Dubai. And that's certified by the Federation. Wow. You know, uh, I got recognized by uh, Barack Obama as one of the top athletes and um, uh, that did, um, uh, supported the uh, martial arts in the world. And that's also certified. Um, when I tested for my seven done, I tested three times. I tested with the Korean master, Husk Back. Uh, I uh, tested with Dennis Ichikawa. And I uh, tested under Terry McMeekin. Three different places just to prove to myself after all this, these years, you know, I got my black belt in 1989. After all these years, I still do it. And I still teach four times a week at my center. You know, I have other people teach. Amazing. But I like to, I think the body, if it stops, it dies. So make it keep on moving. Just fool the body. Tell them, oh, you're okay, you're okay. Um, and lately I got into this breathing exercises into, um, if you tell yourself you're fit, you're good, you know, you're not sick, Automatically, the brain will fool the body by saying, well, he's okay. The minute you start saying, I'm tired, my neck hurts and stuff, which I just said that earlier, mm -hmm. oh, my neck does hurt, uh, <laughs> that uh, uh, it, it feels worse and worse. Right. You know? With that being said, as you, we, we get older, I'm trying to watch my diet and everything. And uh, like I said, one way or another, one angle or another, I will be involved in martial arts. Well, that's amazing. I was just speaking to Kerik Jenis. Uh, he did real drive, by the way. He did? Yeah, him and <laughs> Uh, in Dubai, we're traveling from Abu Dhabi to Dubai. Amazing. And uh, he, he did it. The, the OG of mixed martial arts. Uh, every time we speak with him, it's almost like opening up the encyclopedia for mixed martial arts. When, uh, it's amazing to talk to that guy. Uh, I was just talking to him yesterday, uh, and he was saying that uh, he has one of the first gyms uh, in his city in US, and he was saying that uh, recently his manager left, so he has to get back to coaching and uh, training, and he was like, he's never been happier uh because he just realized how much he missed coaching and uh, i was telling him that uh, you know what uh, i really miss it too you know like uh the best uh the happiest times of my life was always when i was coaching and being in the gym around fighters that energy that atmosphere is something really really special and uh do, do, do you uh get so much time for coaching or do you enjoy coaching as much as uh the lifestyle of training and uh, the other things that you're doing how much do you enjoy coaching now I'll tell you a story just to show you how much I like coaching. Uh, I was, uh, my center in the, in the U.S. Uh, had a re restaurant next to it. And I noticed there's um, deaf and mute people uh, ha having lunch. And they finished and they, well, they start looking. So I told them, can you come in? And he, he said, oh, I, I want to teach you. It could be 10 minutes to teach you. Just to challenge myself, I can teach people. Or, so I start teaching them. Um, and I thought that was so challenging. Because for you to explain to them, you just have to tell them. And I noticed after a couple of minutes, oh, okay, they just have to do what they, what they do. I'm telling them for pain, make sure you tap. And they didn't understand it. And so I go, don't do that. Just go like this. So they understood. So that challenge of teaching someone, I've mean, never, you know, never taught someone like this. They cannot hear you. And you just have to go sure. around. For my fourth dawn test, I want to experiment with uh, uh, blindfolded self-defense just to challenge myself. So mm -hmm. I did my self-defense. Uh, blindfolded, and I noticed if it's a punch or a kick, no, you're gonna get hit. Mm. But if you are being grabbed, then you can defend yourself. But the question is, how do you finish the technique? And I end up thinking, well, okay, you go on top of them in a mount position, but you don't hit them because you might miss. You just put your hands on their face and try to eye gouge them or something. To challenge myself, what would I do if something, God forbid, happened sure. or if I fight in the dark? So I still enjoy uh, teaching. Uh, sometimes, you know, it's a different generation. Yeah. And uh, they don't have the attention span. They don't know what I say, walk around wearing pajamas, listening to people that teach them three things, focus, discipline, and respect. Sure. You know, but I do believe in goal setting. If you set yourself a goal, distant goal, future goal, you have to work on it by going to immediate goals. If you have immediate goals, you have to set yourself to do immediate goals. Just like the belt system. You know, you get your stripe, you get your next level, but the goal is to eventually get your black belt. So when you teach kids focus, discipline, respect, you set the, 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 them to success. The biggest problem that we have lately is that we give too much freedom for kids. You know, you tell them, uh, 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 look, do what you think is right. They're kids, how would they know? Same thing with athletes. Sometimes they want to quit. 
you know that. You know, at one point in the middle of the fight, you say, ah, I want to tap out. You know, I just want But the minute you get over that moment of, should I tap out? Why, instead of tapping out, why don't I try to find a solution? That would be a way of life. You know, I used to laugh at people saying karate is a way of life. Like, oh, karate is a way of life. You fight, you defend yourself. It's not about that. Now sure. in my elder years, I'm thinking, no, it was never about the punching and, and the kicking. It's about you're in a situation that's not very favored to you. So you can quit and bear the consequences or you can try to find a way. Sure. And if there is a will, there's a way. And the, based on that, I used to say, there is not one single grab you cannot get out of. If you, my, my legs are open and my arms are open, I can get out of any grab. Now, if there's a, I'm sitting on my knees and my head is backwards, I'm being choked and I have one hand behind my back, then it's hard to get out, yes. But there will there will be a way, legal or illegal, to get out of any grab that you can. Same thing with life. If you are in a bad situation, at one point or another, you can find a solution. And if you can't, that means you don't have a clear mind. Go ahead, relax, mm -hmm. rest, breathe, <clears throat> and give yourself a different point of view after a while, and come back and revisit it. And 90% of the things, the bad things they expect to happen, don't happen. And if you understand that percentage, 90%, so that means out of 10 bad things I'm expecting to happen, only one of them will happen. Right. You can live with that. And you always ask for yourself, I hope that I have, I have the ability to accept what things I cannot change, but give me the will to change the things I can yeah. change. And if we do that, you know, great. You know, one of the first things I did in my life when I was a kid, I had a Bruce Lee as on, on a t-shirt. Mm -hmm. That was my first t-shirt, having Bruce Lee, you know, Bruce Lee. And I got to the point when I met his wife and talked to her. I met his brother and talked to him for a long conversation. I met his daughter and talk, talked to her. Uh, I went and visited his grave in Seattle. Mm. My mother saw it. Goes, why are you going into a graveyard? I goes, Bruce Lee. She goes, you went to visit Bruce Lee? What is he related to someone you know? I go, no, I just went to see. <laughs> so which makes yeah. no sense. As a kid that I wanted to do, mm -hmm. I ended up doing it as, as I got older. Oh, I the first fighter that I saw winning UFC is one of my best friends. I call him at will. I have his number. He's in Miami right now. I train under him. So imagine my dreams as a kid. Yeah. Watching UFC, having Hoist Gracie winning, but to the point that I sit down and I call him. Uh, I'm taught, sitting with Shahid, you know? I, Dana White, when he sees me, he knows me by name. Uh, I watch what I enjoy to watch and say, tell people, and get, get paid for it, True. and enlighten myself. I am here in Bahrain. I did uh, another refereeing uh, course. And at one point, Mark Goddard, who's also a close friend, said, why do you want to do this? You know, I go, I want to feel what you feel inside the cage. So if there's a mistake happens, I give you an excuse because I had that pressure to, to be in. True. And he said, okay, go ahead. So I started past the course. He went and he had me actually referee a fight in the World Championships. And, uh, and it all went well. So the fact that if you have dreams, you have goals, you set your goals, you set your dreams. Get it. I mean, look, Hamas um, Shahad, we all tie as kids. We're playing around thinking of karate and everything. Sure. As we got older, we're sitting right now talking about martial arts and living the dreams. You're not working. You're living your, your, your dreams. I'm not working. We're sitting here, you know, so can't believe we got to, to this point. Yes. And, and enjoying our lives without, you know, th th there's no pressure. There's, you know, uh, we're enjoying our lives. It, and everything started with the passion of the, of the martial arts. And the intention was never to look at... For me, I would say I never thought these things that we're living in our life would be part of it when I started training. When I was start training, it was purely those little, uh, let's say, those little beautiful things that you feel when you go to a gym, when you get your uh, new belt. You know, it was it was those amazing times. But what made you start martial arts? Um, uh, a, a lot of things, actually. I think it's a combination of a lot of things. Uh, Jackie Chan and Jet Li was a big influence <laughs> for sure, right? Uh, <laughs> One of the nicest guys I've met and sat down and uh, like for. 10 seconds. They didn't let me talk to him. Uh, the person that was with me said, this is not the way you asked to talk to him. She screamed, Jackie would like to talk to you. I'd like to uh, interview you and stuff. He said, no, but you can talk to you. So we talked to him for a couple of seconds. We have the nicest people in the world. Wow. You know? So you're talking about Jackie Chan. You know, they say there's a theory in the world. There's a six degree separation between you and every person in the world. Mm. There are six people. So if we talk about any person right now, any person in the world, you know, if we talk about Hamashai, somebody that knows Hamashai, and he said, well, Habib, yeah, you met him. They say, uh, uh, 
the father of Bahrain, uh, God rest his soul. Yeah, you train with his son, you know. Um, if you have, whoever you can think of, Bill Clinton. Well, you met someone that met someone that met Bill Clinton at one point, you know. At, so we're living the dream, the six degrees of separation. You embody at this point. What were you thinking when you were six years old? Would you think that you're going to be next to world leaders? You know, uh, the, the president of the United States, uh, the royal family. No, we never thought of it this Absolutely. way. Absolutely. But we had passion. So. And passion makes everything go, move around. You know, even let's say you, you love money. Okay. You have passion to collecting money. You'll be rich. Sure. You know, because you find a way. I'll tell you a story about, uh, uh, we, we have a gardener, you know, that came in. Very nice guy, articulate and stuff, really into his, his work. He saw him walking mm. to us. And then eventually he came with a bicycle. After a while, he came with a little motorcycle. I swear to you, at one point I saw him driving a car. And then he came to me, he said, uh, sir, um, do you think you can help me get gardeners to come to Dubai? I'll pay you 10,000, 20,000 for each person if we can bring them on your visa to have. So imagine, imagine a gardener had so much passion to, to doing what he does. He did it via gardening. You know, right. He was getting paid peanuts, but he was driving a car. I'm just driving a car. It's just different car models. True. But he was driving a car. I was driving a car. And he, he wants to be a CEO of some sort. And look, sure. that's what passion did to him. Oh, definitely. And that's, what, and that's what, what probably passion brought you at this, at this stage. 100%. And I also think that uh, I want to know your thoughts on this because a lot of uh, uh, people that come from nothing ends up becoming something. And I think a lot to do with uh, the hunger of... Uh, uh, or being in that lifestyle, right? you, you're desperate, you, you, you have to make a better living. At the same time, you have that hunger to achieve something. And it comes down to fight, fight world as well. Our industry, a lot of athletes came from nothing, uh, from the boxing or mixed martial arts. We see guys coming from France and Ghana, for example, from nothing to where he is today. And uh, Mike Tyson, another big example. And we have maybe 80% of the examples in mixed martial arts is that. But I also feel like one of the key points is nobody talks about the challenges of a middle class fighter who comes from a middle class family he has nothing to worry about he's coming from a normal world there's no hardship i didn't have to fight for a bread you know everything was there i had education i, I, I could become a uh, go into science i could go into commerce commerce i could go into humanities whatever i want to do uh, but what the challenge is when i say that there's pros and cons because when you are hungry and when you're in that position where you have nothing in your life maybe you're on the streets uh, but you still have options to do whatever you want to do. Uh, either you want to go into drugs or you want to be a fighter or you want to be uh, whatever you want to be. You have the choice. Do you have the resources? Maybe not. I mean, definitely not. But you, you have the option, the freedom to choose. Yes, you have the freedom to choose. But when you're in the middle class, yes, you don't have the resources of the rich, but you're in the position. And I think that's the toughest position for anybody to achieve their dreams is when you're in the middle class, in the middle of not there or here where you are brought up with an intention to become something and all your life before you even remember or have, before you even have dreams or uh, intentions of what needs to be done or education, you have already planned your lifestyle, your roadmap, everything is planned for you by the middle-class family to protect you for, especially. But and in that lifestyle, you're in a position where you don't have choices. I can't just, just one day get up and say that, you know what, I'm going to spend uh, all my day training in a gym. Now you got to go to school. You got to come back. You got to go to the tuition. So when you finish the tuition, you come back and you got to do your homework. So when you finish your homework, sleep early because tomorrow morning you have to wake up. Do the same thing again for all your life till you are uh, reaching to a point where you realize that, oh, I'm already 20 and uh, that life is over. And I can't even go to a Dagestan wrestling school uh, and they would kick me out at the age of 14. If that's too late, yeah. you know? So I think nobody ever, there's no movies really built on it. You know, we always talk about the Rocky stories, but I think the middle-class families or middle-class uh, talents are one of the uh, topics we never talk about. And I think for us in Middle East today, uh, when we look at the rest of the world, there's a lot of talents coming in. Do you think for us having a decent lifestyle here, and we, we don't have a lot of homelessness, you know, we don't have that uh, kind of uh, young kids on the street and have, you know, go through that life a lot. Do you think that is also a challenge for us to uh, get that kind of top level talents because that hunger and the drive might be a little bit missing because of our lifestyle? You talked about Rocky movies. In Rocky Three, uh, Apollo Creed sits down in the old gym with Rocky Balboa. And he tells him after his loss to Mr. T at that time, uh, which is uh, Long, Lang something, uh, Clubber Lang, that's the name of the character. He goes, do you know why you lost? He goes, it's the eye of the tiger. You lost that hunger, you know? And you see that afterwards when they train, 
He has no hunger. And he goes, I'll do it tomorrow. He goes, there is no tomorrow. There is no tomorrow. When you put your back to the wall and you have that hunger, you will find a way. Now, reflect that on the situation that we have here. We're, we're blessed, you know, uh, to be living in such a safe, good environment. Uh, people have no hunger. I'll tell you what. I disagree that you cannot find people. It doesn't matter the, how what's their social status. Long time ago, they said the fighter is like a, a statue in a rock. You don't build the rock. You just clean up things around it to make it a statue. I think you will find someone. I'll give you an example. You guys have, you and I talked about it on, on the drive here. Ali Mish'al Ali. Ali, I, I don't Ali, know his last name, but yes, Ali, yes, I think for it's sure. Ali Mish'al. He's one of the, will be the face of MMA in Bahrain. I hope this, when it gets recorded, I want to just clip that one. <laughs> and this kid has so much talent. I'll tell you something. We went into the uh, refereeing seminar and Muhammad Qambar was there. And he, that kid, 10 years old, he did maybe, I swear, 12 fights against guys. I'm not talking about one size, two size. He fought against Muhammad Fakhreddin, brave double champ. Muhammad Fakhreddin, who does not need to do the, the, the refereeing thing. He doesn't. He doesn't have the hunger. To, like, like to, why would he be a referee? He's double champ and brave, and he's fighting in PFL. One of the biggest names, if not the biggest names in, in um, uh, Arabian martial arts or Arabic martial arts, or Middle Eastern martial arts. And he was fighting with this 10-year-old. And they were going, and I did like four or five fights. And I have the, this clips, you know, one day, you know how uh, uh, you see, uh, uh, you meet your idol, you know, and eventually, when he gets to be a champion, we get presented by maybe Brave Belt from Muhammad Fakhreddin, people should play that, that, Amazing, that clip. Yeah, and so when you talk about he's, yeah, he lives in Bahrain, but he has the hunger. It's how we clean up the, the rubbish around it to give them a hunger. And it also comes in, in the upbringing, you know? Uh, what your parents instilled in you or installed inside you to have the hunger. It doesn't matter how rich, uh, how, I still make my own, uh, food and I have a, a maid. Uh, I, I don't let you know. I, I do my own things. Uh, I still clean my own center, my, my martial arts center. I clean it myself. You know, I have someone to clean, it, but I'd like to put everything around afterwards. I still make my bed. I make my kids do their beds because that's the first thing to do. If you give them an, a, an idea very focused, you give them discipline, eventually they'll earn all the respect that they have. You and I came in from the uh, same background, martial arts. You know, and that's what we are emphasized on. You have to get your dues eventually. If you give your discipline, your focus, you get you will get your black belt. You will get to the top of the mountain. Okay. What's the difference between us and our counterparts, our neighbors, our friends when we were kids? You know, people say, ah, they were lucky. No. Bruce Lee says, luck is when the chance meets opportunity. So we both, I think everyone wants to be where we are right now. Knock on wood, uh, alhamdulillah, shukr, that we, we, I, we love what we do. We are, we're, we're doing really well. But the difference between us and our friends when we were kids that had the same, that we worked hard at it. You know, you and I were talking earlier, saying my neck hurts. He said, you know what? My neck is stiff from all the moot, I think. I told you, yeah, you know, we're talking, we are paying the price. True. But we're living the dream. Absolutely. You know? Absolutely. We're sitting down saying, you know, you know we stopped fighting a long time ago. We may have, might have gained some weight. Yes. <laughs> so... At one point, yeah. our bodies were 10 times better than everyone else's. Absolutely. You know, we fought. I fought for the World Championship in 1997, 1999. You know, uh, won. And we pay the price, but we are so happy. So lucky. Absolutely. I dare say, somebody come in right now and let them check our blood pressure. We'll be better than a lot of people, half our age, mainly because we're living, we're doing what we love to do. True. You know? And uh, happiness is wanting what you have, not having what you want. We want what we have, you know? Sure. I, mean, I don't want to be eventually, uh, I don't know, something, this is what I want. I don't want to be the president of a country. I don't want to be the richest man in the, in the world. I want to be happy. And being happy is being content. And right now, I think we're content where we are. Sure. The pri problem is sometimes say, oh, no, you guys got lucky. No, you know, do what we do. Yeah. Pay the price that we paid and then get where we are. And then you can talk. No, absolutely, you know? I keep saying that. Whatever you want to be, get as much education consistently, as much education as possible. Never stop learning and be consistent. Do that for nine hours, 10 hours every single day for the next 15 years. I promise you luck will come to you. You know, uh, we can talk about 15 years if you can do that every single day. Opportunity. Opportunity will present yourself. Um, a quick thing about when people ask me, um, 
when I was uh, doing commentary for uh, Physique TV, I was doing a show called Women Out, Out that was there at that time. Uh, it ceased to exist for a while. And I said, I'm going to go and knock on 10 doors. And at the 10 doors, none of them open. I will stop doing media. I will stop doing uh, commentary. I used to do commentary in English. And then uh, I did the commentary in Arabic for uh, 1FC at that time. When I was with Physique TV, I was doing it for 1FC. One of the third, maybe third at that sure. the third t top of promotion in the world. So I went and called Dubai TV, called uh, NBC, traveled to Bahrain, mm -hmm. met with people under, under you. Like I paid my own ticket to come to Bahrain uh, to meet uh, at that time uh, uh, Victoria, right? And, and uh, Faith and uh, Lloyd. Yes. Lloyd at that time was there. Lloyd was there too. Yeah. An appointment, uh, you know, to see you. And I, he was too busy to see me. <laughs> uh, uh, really knocked on 10 doors. Ten doors, nothing opened up. Like I said, I paid my own ticket to travel around the world, to travel from Dubai to Bahrain to present ideas, you know? Nothing happened. Hang up. Picking up my kids, I said, I, I'm going to quit them. Phone rings. Uh, at that time, someone talked, hi, this is Fouad Darwish, uh, UAE Warriors. Uh, we're, we'd like you to do come. I'm just listening because I get those calls all the time mm -hmm. and nothing goes in. And I, I, I still remember this. And I said, uh, okay. So what do you mean, okay? I go, no, I, I hate to interrupt people when they're talking, which I do that a lot. But I, but I wanted you to finish. And he was so upset. Really, he was upset the way I talked. I didn't know that he was the CEO of UAE Warriors and the, the, the head of Palm Sports at that time. So I said, no, I, I don't mean to interrupt you, but I just, you know, he goes, I, I can see in his voice like he doesn't, is he, is he, does he know who I am? And I swear, I, and he said, where are you from? He said, Iraq. And I swear to you, the tone changed. He said, you know, I love Iraq. Forget about the job. Forget about what I'm calling for. Let's talk about Iraq. Things went smooth. You know, at that time, you know, he said, we'd like you to uh, do uh, uh, the, the show for us. I said, I have no issue. I guess Al Hosseini could make it, blah, blah, uh, Same week, Al Hosseini, Muhammad Al Hosseini calls me. He said, UFC is coming to uh, uh, Abu Dhabi TV. We want you to be one of the first commentators, me and Ammar Al Ahmed, to be the first commentators to be there. Boom. So I did that. I did that. Uh, at that time, there's a uh, social knockout happening, which is boxing event in English. So I was doing English uh, commentary, Arabic commentary, UFC, uh, uh, Warriors. Uh, uh. In the process of these things, I, I believe I did uh, uh, Brave before that, I did number yes. 20, 21, 22. So I gave it my shot. When I thought everything's closed, God had another plan for me and everything went smooth Absolutely. afterwards. But did I knock on 10 doors? Yes, I knocked on 10 doors. I, I wanted to have something. And I'm sure at one point, you know, when you finished your fighting career professionally, you wondered also where you're going to go. Absolutely. How did you do the transformation, by the way, if you don't mind me asking? Well, for me, it was always, uh, um, uh, even uh, from childhood, when I started martial arts, uh, it was always about uh, the legacy. Legacy, legacy, legacy was always in my mind. Understanding, and you really use the two words when you said focus and discipline. Uh, and I was an advocate uh, when I was teaching to tell people that it's nice to hear focus and discipline, but I would really like to teach you what focus and discipline means. Uh, because I think uh, kids like me who came from uh, private schools in, uh, you know, our parents came here trying to make a living and trying to get their children in school, as long as they get education, which they didn't get in their time, so they don't have the time to look at where is the best education, you know, what kind of uh, teaching they do or, or the teachers are, you know, where they come from. None of that. Go to school. You get what I don't get, you know, and that was just the mentality. So we used to go to schools and we used to have teachers who used to tell us, uh, we talk, we ask questions, keep your mouth shut, sit in the corner, yeah. quiet, be disciplined. And we eventually we hear hearing that for 17 years, we really thought discipline means keeping quiet, quiet and sitting in the corner. How would you define this in your in Shah's words? So for me, I've always said that uh, to understand discipline is definitely to know oneself, you know? So that is a key point for us. And uh, the day you can know yourself, you will know that you understood discipline. But how do you know yourself? That's, you know, we get deeper. I think it, it might get a little bit philosophical. But I always say that to know yourself, it's uh, multiple things. But the most common, which people always talk about, is to be living in uncomfortable zone, right? So the day you keep living in adversity and live in uncomfortable zone, that's the only place where you will learn about yourself more than the places you're in comfort. So why do you not keep chasing uncomfortable zone all your life 
and put yourself in that position because if that's the only place I can keep improving. But again, it doesn't mean that you be in an uncomfortable zone and then you go into depression or you go into a position where you're like, you know, my life is dead, I wanna die, you know? Don't go into that position where it should affect you negatively. But the more idea of wanting to learn, I think that is the key. But when we say the word discipline, I really think it is always about uh, being able to project manage yourself, mm. you know, and that is key for us. So uh, if you can uh, realize, and I don't use that word in, in, in any other way, but when I say that, uh, not religiously, but I'm, I always say that I am God, I am Satan, and I am me. Uh, and it's not religiously, but what I mean by that is think of yourself as three different uh, parts uh, where your body is the fourth, but I'm not going to discuss about it. But the God is the one that always tells you good things uh, and uh, the one that you always love and respect and uh, look forward to becoming. And then you have Satan. It doesn't matter for what. I wake up 4 a.m. in the morning to run. The Satan is speaking in my ears not to go for a run. It's okay. Today you need to recover. And he gives me the best advices, by the way. He tells me that you need to recover because you had a tough training yesterday. Today, if you recover, imagine you can do double the hard work in the evening sparring session. And that is more important than the run you're going to do it for him. And I'm like, it's very convincing, you know, and they're absolutely right, you know. I'm like, do I want to have tough sparring session? Yes, get some rest, recover. And I feel good about it when I wake up, I'm like I'm fully recovered. And then I realize that he was so right. Too. I'm like, he caught me again. Yeah. And that's every time, right? My brother's watching Champions League finals with uh, pizzas ordered out. And I'm like, I Football, I would die for it, you know. Mm. And I'm watching, I have to sleep because the match is at 11. It goes to 1, I have to sleep at 10 because I wake up at 3.30. And I'm like, damn it, you know. But I'd go and sleep. And only thing that's with me while I'm sleeping is uh, Mike Tyson's uh, uh, YouTube uh, compilation because that's the only thing that'll help me a little bit maybe, you know. Oh, wow. Whatever it takes to do that. But I go and I sleep and I wake up in the morning. But the point is not that I am doing good things that's best for me. The point is how I'm dealing with that Satan in my body uh, and that all that conversation. And I'm living this life with nobody in the world, me and myself. And who is myself? Is that Satan and that God and that uh, spirit, ultimately what you're trying to become, the soul that you're trying to build uh, something into. And these two are always fighting and I'm trying to become in the side of God. And it's just, you could call it good, bad and uh, something else, but I'm just naming it similarly because I want that. It could be an angel. Satan, you know, absolutely. Um, I, I like the, the definition of discipline as doing what you have to do, even if you don't want to. You know? Simple as that, right? Which is exactly what you just said. Simple as know? that. I, wanting to, uh, like, waking up despite you wanting to sleep. Absolutely. You know? So doing what you have to do, because you know, uh, doing the right thing. Sometimes it's 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 discipline, but without going into right or wrong. In essence, in essence, martial arts shaped up our lives. You know, don't, don't you think that Absolutely. that pushed us into some things? That's why when you talk about football, I have a lot, a lot of passion about football when I was a kid. There is no better sport in the world than martial arts, mainly because the, uh, football can give you enjoyment. Sure. It can give you good uh, uh, health, but it doesn't give you that commitment that you have in martial arts. And if it gives you the commitment by having, you know, doing your exercises, running, running, knowing how to shoot, uh, how, how to kick the ball and stuff, it doesn't give you the values that martial arts give. With all due respect to football, you can still do martial arts and do football. As a matter of fact, martial arts, you and I come from striking background, Taekwondo, Tang Sudo, you are a better football player for doing martial arts. You know, you, you have much better uh, idea of how to do a kick absolutely when you do be striking out you know people think it's such a great thing to do uh the uh the, 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 the bicycle, kick, yes yeah. which is for us a jump front kick you know? <laughs> day one come in put your belt white belt on do this lift your <laughs> yeah. left leg kick the right leg you know kick uh, jump around kick lift the left do the right which makes it easier absolutely. so i do think martial arts helps even the parents uh, discipline their kids by giving them a martial arts school. And sometimes people think, well, you know, I don't want to wear pajamas and stuff. I want to be an MMA fighter and stuff. I think to me, the most successful MMA fighters, you know, you and I talked also earlier about the, the GOATs, you know, and uh, what do you say? Fedor, uh, Fedor Habib, Habib and GSP. GSP and yeah. together. So let's talk about those those three guys. One from wrestling, uh, uh, one from Sambo, and one from traditional karate martial arts. So those guys, the most successful people started with traditional martial arts 
and they went in. If you remember, uh, Habib used to fight with his gi, you know, on top. Uh, GSP, when he walks into the cage as his black belt. So these are, to me, the, the most successful people. They came in from martial arts. And that, I think, when you eventually, let's talk about uh, uh, Musk and uh, uh, what's his name? Uh, Mark, uh, the, 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 Mark Zuckerberg and they're not doing martial arts right now. Yes, true. You know, because they know the value of martial arts. Absolutely. You know, uh, to be successful, I, I think you need discipline. Yeah. You need to be uncomfortable in situations. You need to push yourself to the limit. And with focus and discipline, you will get the respect. Respect is earned, not given. So at one point, we will see the results. You will get your gratitude. Uh, you know, I, I like to think of myself as the highest paid. Uh, UFC commentator in the Arab world. I'm not. I'm close to it. But, but when people tell me why do you, you you're doing what you love, why do you want to ask for for that much? Money? I go. It's not the money. It's what the money represents. When you give me the most, you are saying I am the best. And I, I'm I'm well, well off. You know, thank God and everything. But the money represents how much you respect me. My status. My how do you rank me, how many people like to listen uh, the way I do commentary. I pay a lot of uh, attention to details. I talk about rules. I talk about the history. I talk about relationship experiences. If I talked about Benil Daryush, I go, Benil Daryush love to have Iraqi kebabs, you know? Because when he came to Abu Dhabi, he, he said that's the best food he's ever had. He has two girls and he loves to drive a Tesla because it's very safe with his wife that collects every single uh, glove that he, he fought in. If I give you that information, I worked hard to get to there. Absolutely. You know, yeah. if I sit down with someone and I talk about, yeah, brave, yeah. You know, Shahid, by the way, people don't know that Shahid has uh, four and one record, but it should be four mm -hmm. and two because he knocked someone out in 16 seconds. I got to this information because I worked hard at this. Absolutely. I need to be recognized for, for that. Same thing with you. Same thing. You, If you pay the price, you should get... What, 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 you're, what you're supposed to. And again, it's not about the, the, the money. Uh, it's about the, what the money represents. And um, the, the fighters, eventually, when you talk about hunger and stuff, first, you should not do it for the money. Because if you're doing it for the money, your career is going to be very... Right. Good. And if you have a little bit of, of money and you get delusion that I'm doing this so I can get a better, uh, more money for my family, then you're not, you're in the wrong uh, profession. It's a byproduct of... It's passion. Absolutely. You know? so, the key, the priority is your passion and what you love to do. And everything is a byproduct of it, you know, uh, money, the lifestyle, everything is a byproduct. And for me, that's that's the thing, you know, I don't mind working uh, 18 hours a day. It doesn't make, it's fine. Because it's not work. It's not work, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, I mean, Chad, you're not working. Absolutely. You're living your childhood dream. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. <laughs> you know? That's what I said, you know, some, some of the guys are like, you, you don't want to feel like going back to fight. I said, yes, I do want to do that. But I'm also enjoying making people fight too, no, you know, that, yeah, that's yeah. also a fun part of uh, the business. My, my, my brain says yes, but my body says, let's not do it right now. <laughs> that, that, that's a big part of it yeah, for yeah. sure. Uh, but legacy, that is so important for me. And I think that, uh, that that's always been something that drives me uh, from um, starting a gym in Bahrain, becoming a fighter. But most importantly, I always felt like, there's something bigger. Uh, there should be a change. And how can I build? And, I, and when I say change, I, I would use the word reform because how can I bring positive change into something? And uh, I'm, not, I'm not a person who knows a lot about many things. I don't know a lot about many things in the world. But when it comes to combat sports, when it comes to sports, that is the only thing I would say I know. When you, if you ask me about anything else in the world, I don't know whether it's science, whether it's cars, whether I, I have no idea. But... Uh, uh, sports and martial arts, combat sports, of course, but uh, sports in general, this is something that I have um, every single day, breakfast, lunch, and dinner is sports and combat sports. I, I, like, I like what you said. When you know what you're good at, you know, I, I always tell uh, people I meet, I'm good at three things. Uh, teaching martial arts. I don't say practice. Teaching martial arts. Negotiating and a third thing we cannot talk about on that. Right. <laughs> yes, I'm good at. But <laughs> with, with that being said, you know, I always make a What do you? What does he mean exactly? But there's a, you know, uh, I think if you know what you're good at, yeah, you know, you'll go because you know your ability. True. You, you know, the, the, I'm great in striking. I'm not as good in, in grappling. You know, but yet I've been doing grappling since 1998. I think I was got my cert first certificate from Carlson Gracie, 1998. Eight, and still I have not achieved the black belt because I think black belt in jiu-jitsu is something so big. Exactly. It took me nine years to get to my brown from purple to brown. 
you know, they say that's the longest distance usually between the jiu-jitsu belts. But know your ability, know what you can bring to the table, and you'll be a happy man because you'll know your shortcomings, you know. And uh, uh, if, if you know who you are, then you'll get to tell people who you are. Definitely. And, and I think martial arts really teaches. And that's why when you ask, uh, when you're talking about the differences between sports and martial arts, absolutely right. I think mo- the difference between uh, football and martial arts or basketball and martial arts is you as an individual, whether you're Cristiano Ronaldo or Messi, you are one of the best football players uh, and you can be good at football. If you're good at martial arts, you're, you just understood almost, I wouldn't say completely, but you, you are reaching to the highest level of knowing human being and being a human being that you can understand beyond sport, uh, beyond the game itself. I think that's the key thing for me in martial arts and why parents should send their kids to uh, do martial arts. I mean, again, it has to be the right gym and the right places. You know, there's no question we've been living uh, the martial arts life all our lives and we've seen uh, as much as great martial artists we've met and trained with, there are also a lot of uh, martial artists. You know, it's something I always want to ask you. That 16 seconds fight that you knocked out the person, can you talk about it? Because oh, I was sure. Really to... Oh, yeah, because... Uh, was that your last fight or was that... No, the, no, no, that was... was uh, I can't remember which fight was that, but that was a fight where I was... I just knew that my uh, opponent is a pure wrestler and uh, and uh, I knew that he's going to come and go for takedown instantly because um, before my fourth... I started the professional career where they were counting my fights. I do a lot of gym fights uh, okay. in gym. We had this thing called gym wars in India as well. So I used to do a lot of competition Muay Thai in Thailand, you know, the every week fights. Uh, so I used to do that and then just to get the experience and then um, uh, go and compete in uh, gyms. Between gyms, I used to have competitions, national championships and everything used to happen in gyms because they didn't have facilities. I used to go and fight there. So a lot of people in India at that time before my first fight knew me because the, where, where all the India comes to do national championships were in gyms. And there I used to take four fights, five fights a night and uh, knock out everybody in the one night. So everybody knew that I, I was good at striking, you know. They knew that he's, he knocks out guys with elbows, knees, head kicks. And uh, so they're like, you know what? Let's get him a wrestler. L- let's get him a wrestler. And uh, so they got the wrestler, but the wrestling guy was like, I'm not standing with him for even a second. Mm. And I knew that he knew that. And, we, you know, it's just the mind games. And then he went for a takedown. I got the double under turned him to the cage, got that uh, forearm uh, position on his uh, neck, got the underhook on the other side, put him on the cage, tilted uh, towards uh, his head, so his uh, head goes down and uh, that knee was right there. Was he grounded fighter? He didn't touch the floor? No, he didn't touch the floor. Uh, but because of my forearm being in that position, I couldn't see his hand or anything, but I knew it because I was holding him, right? Uh, and I knew the position. I knew the length of where the hand would touch and not touch. So we, it's it's the cage control practice we've done. And I knew that was my favorite position. So I threw my first knee. But the thing I didn't realize is usually when I knock people out, sometimes in that position, uh, they usually put the hand up. And I don't know if I'm hitting the hand or the face okay. uh, until my knee gets that bone structure. But sometimes yeah. you don't get it because yeah. if it's on the cheek, sometimes you don't and get the, it. The hand goes back anyway. So Yeah. So when I threw the first knee, I didn't expect him to get knocked out in the first knee. But I threw the first knee and he got knocked out. He went on the ground, he touched his middle finger on the floor, scratched it on the floor, and then I lifted him up for a second. So you got to pull back for the knee. So I had to lift him up, part of the body structure. So I lifted him up. He's still knocked out. His hand is up on the floor. And I threw the knee, my knee landing on his face and his finger touching on the floor. Today's rules, it's different. It yes, okay. yeah. was at the same time. I didn't rewatch it. This is why I got disqualified. So I just accepted. But a lot of people say, didn't touch. Uh, we're not going to micro check that and yeah, zoom it. Yeah, yeah. But in the end of the day, I knew it was, uh, in the end of the day, if it did, it did. Uh, but that was it. I shouldn't have thrown the second knee in the first place. But, but I what know. was the referee? The referee should have jumped into fear when he knocked him out the first time, you know? Uh, yeah, but I do, I do, uh, But the thing was, I don't think that he, he. Uh, I don't know if he knew it was a knockout because it just, you know, you know how you throw two knees at, uh, back yeah, to yeah, back, yes, you know? Yes, yes. Pam, pam, you're just going back to back. And I don't know if there was uh, the time for that. But in any case, it was what it is. But then um, uh, what annoyed me was my next fight. When I won the fight, the guy from the interview, he came and interviewed me and he's like, uh, oh, you know, uh, how do you feel like coming from a loss to a win? And I was like, stupid. <laughs> Who lost? <laughs> when I fight with someone, in my, in my dictionary, if one guy is sleeping and I'm standing, for me, this guy who's standing is a winner. Yeah, but you know, John Jones has one loss, which the guys claim to fame. <laughs> they got knocked out by John Jones mm-hmm. by 12 to 6 elbow. As. You know, uh, which I, uh, this is. 12 to 6 is stupid. 
I agree. I think this is one of the rules that should be changed. As long as you uh, protect the fighter from the, the area between the ears, you know, then it's okay. You know why this rule, by the way, was stole? I, well, you and I have something to do with it. Traditional martial, traditional martial arts. arts. Yes. <laughs> they used to have, uh, uh, they bring uh, ice blocks, blocks and you break them by 12 to 6 elbow. And when people saw like you breaking out a six, seven ice blocks with an elbow, they said, this is going to kill someone. Here's the trick that people don't know. Record that. If you put salt into the ice, it's easily broken. So when they used to do it like this, and I'll tell you something else, the Taekwondo boards are very thin. Anyone can break them. It's not and that impressive. And there's spaces between them. Yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I've broken a lot. <laughs> and if you want to make it real easy, I have a six-month-year-old daughter that broke a Taekwondo board. But, but if you want to make it easy, another trick, you bake them, and then they break. So eventually, there's a lot of tricks, but eventually you have to be true to yourself. But that's why the 12 to 6 was installed because of those movies. Just like another rule that I never understood. In the United States, carrying in California, carrying an unchaco, is a felony. Having a gun is a misdemeanor. So people say, what are you talking about? Yes, because you have the right to carry arm, but when people saw Bruce Lee's movies, what he was doing with an Nunchaku, they thought this is more dangerous than even a gun. And that's why carrying an Nunchaku in California, it's a felony, while carrying a gun is a misdemeanor. Wow, yeah. wow. I mean, on the positive side, the impact of martial arts, you know? <laughs> it's, yeah, it just, yeah, it just scared, scared everyone. <laughs> but yeah, it definitely did, you know? So it's crazy. I want to jump into uh, one of the things, we've spoken a lot about martial arts, you know, and that shows a lot of um, the knowledge you have in uh, combat sports and martial arts and, and the history behind it. And like you said, today you are the voice of uh, mixed martial arts for the Arab world. Uh, you have uh, one of the biggest uh, media platforms in the Arab world as well with MMA. All out, and uh, again, it was a pleasure uh, taking the ride with you. Love to do that more often. Love to have that chat, and it was a very interesting one. Uh, caught me with few questions there, <laughs> but yeah, I told you some easy ones, some hard ones. But I loved it. I love, uh, I love it. I always like to dive into the conversations, which are always the hard conversations, and the hard conversations are not to put anybody down or to praise somebody else. Sure. It's always about what is the reality and. For me, legacy is built when you can make the positive change. And we are here as Brave Combat Federation, as KHK. One of the, uh, nobody knows the backstory or the history of where we come from. It was never about, hey, let's uh, do another promotion because it feels good. It's MMA. We love it. Let's do an event. It was never about that. Uh, we never wanted to have an organization or promotion of ourselves because it was a, a real serious headache and we know it. Uh, like I said, one thing I know is the mi mixed martial industry and the business of mixed martial art. And that's something that I, nobody can ever take away from me. I lived it uh breakfast lunch and dinner and snacks you know and that that's my life so one of the things why brave the khk everything was built together it is not separate things it's one big ecosystem uh to build a positive change in mixed martial industry i always speak about it and i always say that mixed martial art is in the event business not in the sports business uh you could have habib and connor fight or shakira and beyonce fight it's the same <laughs> thing you know same, you want to have actually, and actually one of them will have more uh more followings and more views than the other one and i'm not talking about the bearded <laughs> ones you know <laughs> absolutely absolutely but that's the world we're in today uh of course we made that slight change in the mixed martial industry and i know where we come from i know where our sport come from we were uh, nothing in 1993 i know that uh, people didn't appreciate the sport didn't understand the sport the media didn't understand the mainstream legacy media didn't understand the sport so what we have achieved from that to where we are today is amazing but I don't think we should still be holding on to that torch and say that that is the biggest thing that happened and let's uh, enjoy the past and uh, look and say that let's forget the next 15 to 20 years or the next 50 years, in fact, of what our sports could be and what we would uh, take it towards. And I think that boxing was uh, in that position where they've enjoyed this enjoyed the past too much and they've reached to a point that today uh you don't need broadcasting channels youtube is the best because the youtubers are the boxers we don't even know i mean you must you're in this uh sports broadcast world so i'm sure that you understand it but uh, uh, just a boxing fan like me i don't even know who lamachenko for the last time uh although we love some of the best athletes in boxing and we love to follow them but the promotion the marketing the the, the thing is not as interesting as the jake Paul's or the ksis and uh, the deji's fighting you know and that's the world today and i think mixed martial art we've made a slight change in terms of not all about the fighter it's all about the promotion as well and we could have much more bigger storylines behind it but i think we're still in the event business as all combat sports 
And uh, eventually we're going to reach a point that as an organization, I will think and I'll say, you know what? I am also a media platform, but I think viewers and numbers are the most important thing. So why only stick to MMA? Why don't I have kickboxing and Muay Thai and Jiu Jitsu also added? And tomorrow I can add uh, wrestling and uh, uh, Sanda and everything else. And at the same time, I could even switch sports and I could even have cage basketball to slapping competition in my organization. I could have any of this, you know? What do you think of the slap competition? <sighs> Honestly. I, it's it's BS. Okay. I mean, uh, BS in the sense that, uh, uh, what I mean by this, don't get me wrong. I mean, who loves it, love it. But what I mean by BS is, uh, it, I can't associate that with MMA. I can't associate that with anything of sports that we're doing. Uh, it's like, and I, and I enjoy it in the sense that I love to watch it, you know, to be honest. Yeah, why do we, that's, that was my question. I think it's exactly, I, I think this is stupid. There's not, nothing into it. But then when you watch it, you, you get to... Wow, look, absolutely, got, uh, absolutely yeah, right. Like, I, and I always say that, I mean, our sport was lucky enough to come, uh, to be born in the internet era. Yeah. One of the biggest reasons why UFC is UFC today, uh, I tell them that uh, it's not because they have a great business model. Don't get me wrong. They are the monopoly in the MMA world and they've reached where they are because the industry was them. Yeah. Uh, but uh, at the same time, what got them to where they are today is also our sport of MMA uh, in general. Uh, and that's not just UFC. Everybody who was the beginners at the, uh, uh, at the internet time, we were all born at the internet times. And at the internet times, we could watch uh, things that we could never watch on television in our lives. Sure. And the things we could watch was one is... Uh, and the privacy of our own as well. You absolutely. Know, you're almost having your own TV. You can go to your room, you can go under your bed and, and watch whatever you want and to watch. And we as yeah. kids, we, we uh, in my house, we had internet from the uh, landline yeah. and uh, we, were, we were still... <laughs> <laughs> but I'm afraid somebody picks up the phone and hears that. Yeah. So we used to go, oh, I've got to take a shower and I'd close the door and we went on the internet, right? So we could watch things that nobody else could watch. But at that time, we had uh, things like uh, terrible stuff like uh, uh, Face of Deaths. I don't know if you remember that, where, where they're just talking about showing people dying, which would never have shown in the F television. Final de Destination, you mean? No, yeah. no, Face of Death was just just a content on you, uh, on internet or YouTube, where they were just talking, showing some deaths that happened in the streets, like, you know, how a guy got stabbed, the guy uh, got, uh, he was blowing something, somebody jumped and his uh, head yeah. blasted, you know, or car accidents and stuff like that. It was, uh, thank God those things are not there anymore, but those are things we would never watch in television. Kids are sitting and watching that. I mean, definitely they've regulated it. But then the other thing was sexual content as well. Yeah. But then the third thing was combat sports fights like MMA, uh, K1s, which we couldn't have really seen on television as often as we would like to. But we saw this and we were really seeing elbows and knees and head kicks. Uh, and that was one of the things that the young generation, what we were at uh, 20 years back, 25 years back, we started watching those and we grew up and that fan base started building because this was one of the three contents that we could never watch on television. And we, that became the internet's face of contents. And uh, MMA was part of that. And that's why when you look back and you really dig deep into the MMA industry, not only UFC, but anybody in that time, the internet time guys or the internet time promotions were all successful. You, you, even till today, if you, I mean, for me, it's very hard to name uh, many promotions today, you know, but at the, at, we still know what Strike Force was. We still know what Affliction was. We yeah. still know what Pride was. We still know what WEC was. We uh, still know what M1 uh, in a way was. We are, UFC, of course, we knew what UFC was. So we knew those, we were watching all of those. They were all part of the content and we know what K1 was. And uh, even today, if you look at it, if you ask me K1 kickboxing, I'm always Ernest to host Peter Arts. Uh, you know, the, the old school guys is always there in uh, my head, you know, and uh, you still use them in 2023, regardless of what their age, and you still try to sell tickets in glory and kickboxing today using the Badr Haris and the, uh, yes. you know. and But even, I'll tell you what, even in, in the, the Middle Eastern MMA, you still have, like, who's the face of MMA in, in Bahrain? Hamza Kohiji. Where did he start? Uh, Desert Force. There you go. Fakhreddin, double Desert champion Force. in Desert Force. Yeah. Uh, Silawi in, in PFL, Desert Force. Absolutely. You know, uh, Ahmed Laban, uh, who fought to, for you guys. Uh, same thing, Mohamed Yahya, who went to Bellator, Desert Force. Now, this generation is going to go. We are about, you and I and all the people who are involved in martial, uh, uh, mixed martial arts, we need to look for the next generation. Those guys will be Hall of Famers. And I hope, I, I tell this to uh, whoever has a promotion, one day we have, and if nobody does the MMA All Out, we'll do it. We will have Hall of Fame and we'll induct the people that deserve to be inducted. And those, the, the pioneers of uh, Desert Force, and who else was there? Uh, DFC, Dubai Fighting Championships, also started at the same time. ADFC True. also started around the same time. True. I think there was a promotion in Kuwait. Uh, GFC. Uh, GFC, but there was no another one. Um, God, no. Uh, 
anyways, also started uh, in Kuwait, need to be recognized. Those people are pioneers, you know? Absolutely. See, it's one time we have to put, at one point, we have to put them in the Hall of Fame. And now we are about to witness history because this generation is getting older. We have to look at the new generation. Absolutely. And the new generation, we are all responsible for bringing it. The biggest thing we can do, you know, when I do commentary uh, in Arabic or in English, I make a point of explaining the criteria of how someone wins. I was like live on Abu Dhabi TV. This is real all time with blah, blah, blah. Uh, live uh, coming to you guys. And here comes the first round. It is three rounds. Each round is five minutes. Uh, the winner gets 10 points. The, the loser gets nine and less uh, under different criteria, blah, blah, blah. So when I say it, it's a cliche every single time. So eventually people will know the criteria is how people uh, can judge uh, the rounds and that's how we uh, make people aware you know the, yeah. the, the education and the awareness of the mixed martial arts and this is upon our shoulders and hopefully we'll do a good job so the people after us that will come in we have built the, the road for all of them you know absolutely absolutely mm -hmm. and i think uh it's this. Uh, we always say that the sport of mixed martial arts was built by MMA lovers. Whether it's uh, today, if you look at the promoters, you look at the MMA media platforms, and we didn't need the legacy of uh, mainstream media at one point when they didn't cover mixed martial arts. You say by male lovers? MMA lovers. Okay, MMA lovers. I heard <laughs> male lovers. Like, oh. <laughs> uh, like maybe women have built this. By the way, it's something I want to ask you also. Brave doesn't have um, female fighters. We do. We do have females fighting but not uh, a consistent division of uh, female uh, division as it is as a roster. Okay. We do have females uh, fighting very consistently in Brave, uh, but we don't have a division as, as of yet. Uh, that's where we, we uh, for us, I think uh, uh, the eyes of the ball, we, we, we're making sure that our goal is very clear. Okay. Our vision is very clear and we want to change the sport from an event business to sport business. So there is a lot of factors to it. One, it's not about the fighters uh, in the sense that it's not about, oh, I want to sign the biggest fighter. Who's the biggest fighter that's here? Let's sign him. None of that is the priority. The priority is one, how can you create a platform that even tomorrow a fighter comes in and he has a talent, and I don't have to worry about if he's a big fighter, if he's a famous fighter, none of that. Yeah. I would love to, if he is, it's, it's always a bonus, definitely. It always helps. We all know that because that's our industry currently in. But it doesn't matter if he has a talent and I want to look for that special talent. If he comes on board, how can I make him uh, reach to the potential, not as a fighter, because he has a talent and that's his gym and his trainers and his coaches, but make him reach that point where he becomes a symbol of what, his hard work. And that's the responsibility of the promotion. Today, half the promotions keep saying that we are all about the fighters as a message. It's a very good PR message, but they're not about the fighters because they always look for fighters who can add value to the promotion. None of the promotions really add value to the fighters as their real goal. And that's in actions you can see. And it doesn't matter you have 5 billion followers on social media and you say you're the biggest platform in the continent. But at the end of the day, the question you will ask is, how many superstars have you built, built yeah. from there? You must, you're, you're one of the organizations maybe that take the superstars that are already built and one of the biggest prospects in the world and you bring them and they're lost, you know? Yeah, so yeah. what is the use of your billion followers and viewership that is putting out as numbers? I don't give a S about the numbers yeah. because it's, let's talk reality. Let's not come into this world of the bubble. We are in the MMA bubble where we all are, you know, lost in this mind of fantasy that, you know, once they're an American promotion, they're great. Or once somebody says that they have 90% of a continent, that's right. You, if you're talking about 90% of Asia, you're missing out on West Asia, South Asia, and Central Asia. Do you know that we are all West Asians? Where is your presence in West Asia? What have you done for the West Asia? If you think about it, the biggest sports, you want to talk business, the biggest sports investment opportunity today is West Asia. You want to talk about the biggest uh, population today is South Asia. You want to talk about the biggest talent in Asia for MMA is Central Asia. Mm -hmm. And what are you talking about when you say you have 90% of Asia? Either you haven't uh, learned geography in school or you are racist. It's one mm -hmm. of these two things. Mm -hmm. uh, so this, but it's me talking, it's my opinion. Uh, but at the same time, it's funny how our industry... Everybody has a part to play in it as promoters, as fighters, as media platforms, as managers, and as gyms. Everybody in our community has a role to play in it. And we all end up in this bubble where we're like, we believe it, you know, and that must be the truth. Uh, and that's the situation. Well, what, what do you think, in your opinion, the top five MMA promotions in the world? Um, for me, it depends on what, what we're talking about. UFC is UFC 100%. Uh, the uh, Bellator... 
And uh, for me, I would say, see, uh, UFC is because it's complete. Yes. It's yes. everything. Uh, but UFC is not the future of MMA. It is the present of MMA. It is, we all wanted mobile phones when we were young. Mm. And we really wanted it. And I was competing with my friends about, do you have the water drop version? Or you have the other version of the Nokia's N90 or N91s and all that stuff. And uh, eventually, one fine day, I woke up in the morning and I just, my brother asked me, Wait. You have no. What is Nokia? And I said, what happened? We're like, no, not a new brand came and took over it. A new system came. Apple bought a new system that killed everything else. Uh, BlackBerry changed the game. It, it did yes, BlackBerry, yeah, but BlackBerry. Yeah, and then uh, and uh, and for me, Apple, because the, if you look at the history of Apple, they were having this vision of global ecosystem very long right. back. Yes. They were not thinking of creating a better model. BlackBerry bought a better model, but not the ecosystem. Yeah. Samsung is still failing to bring the ecosystem around it. But Apple did, although I'm a Samsung guy, by the way, but uh, <laughs> Apple did bring that thing. And I say that UFC is a Nokia today. It is the biggest brand. Everybody's fighting for it. This is everything. But the Apple is Brave Combat Federation. And Nokia had 80% share of the, of the market at that time. And they didn't do anything wrong. If you think about it, they, they didn't, didn't do anything, anything wrong. They just did not see that coming because nothing, everyone, all of us had Nokia. All of us had the 80%, 90%, even market share in the Middle East. And then when Apple came, now you know. we were nobody, satisfied with it also. Yes, yes, we were, we're happy. happy. The snake you know, was amazing. It was getting smaller and smaller. You can put it right here. Absolutely. And then all of a sudden, uh, they came in with uh, with the uh, iPhone, and the iPhone gave you ops, uh, access to the internet, and you can see anything you want to see. <laughs> and so it came began bigger, so you can see better and Absolutely. better, you know. But they changed. You're, you're right. I like the analogy that yeah. right, it's the present, but you don't know how. But that's why for me, UFC is the biggest. But it is the present of MMA. Today, the identity of MMA is UFC. It is everything. When we talk about mobile phones, it's Nokia. When we talk about MMA, it's uh, UFC. That's where we are today. Bellator is one of the promotions I really respect because they are not here to jump into this media uh, frenzy where you're like, okay, I want to take the biggest fight without thinking of having... A sustainable business model. Sustainable business model is key because our reputation of mixed martial art business industry is dying because everybody looks at mixed martial arts and says it's not a money making uh, business. Yes. I mean, in the end of the day, Bellator has become, uh, I respect them because they look at the business model and they don't want to do anything crazy about it. W what they do, sure, they would, that's affecting them in becoming known in the US as number two promotion or some people around the world as well. They're talking, as num uh, talking of Brave uh, Bellator as number two. But good business model, so I respect Bellator a lot. So who's three, four, and five? Uh, so I respect them a lot. Again, I, I don't think Bellator is number two. Oh, you don't? Okay. I just think that they have a great business model. Okay. And I think UFC is not the future. So I don't have the numbers. UFC is the, uh, the Nokia. Bellator is the most uh, respectable because of their business model. And then... For me, it's only Brave that exists there, okay. and I'll tell you why. No, no, it's okay. So I, I uh, know why Brave oh, yeah, is different. Sure. Yeah, yeah. And, then, and then for me, when it comes to today, the, uh, uh, what do you call it? Uh, uh, when Viral. The okay. viral name of MMA today is PFL. That's the viral organization today is PFL. And... Uh, Who might be coming to... Uh the Middle East, by the way. Absolutely, and uh, we are very happy to uh, collaborate with them as well. We've been having conversations with them. They're really good in terms of open-minded uh, organization. One of their best fighters uh, went over there, right? Uh, Jarrah. Jarrah is yeah. there. We have a With your blessings, I believe, right? Absolutely. Yeah. We have a dual contract. There's never been a dual contract in the top promotions in the world. Today, we have a dual contract with... Uh, uh, Jarrah. No, no, with oh. um, uh, uh, Abdullah Kahtani. Okay. So we have a dual contract where he will fight in PFL and Brave at the same time in the contract. And that's, it, 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 it exists. You, you made it happen, right? Yes, I've never heard of that. You know? Absolutely. I've heard of permissions, you know, like I, I, I fight in Brave, but can I we'll go and fight in Warriors? No, can I yeah, go? there's yes, a dual yeah. contract signed so we could compete in both the organizations at the same time, uh, exclusive to PFL and Brave. Okay. So that is something that's, you know, when you have open-minded organizations, they help change. So, so that's four? Give me number five. Oh, uh, number five, I think it could be anything. We have uh, ACAs, we have uh, uh, Octagon, we have uh, uh, a lot of organizations that are regional. Okay. These are num uh, the best. And I know that I'm missing one which everybody thinks is in the top three, and that's one championship. And I think a lot of people are uh, playing with that uh, thing, but I don't think there's uh, anything other than uh, in that organization. I just don't think that... Uh, uh, 
there is i don't see a sustainable business model i don't see it becoming the present of mma mm. uh, i don't see it uh, as a viral content like pfl is today P pfl is a viral organization because of the investment and funds that they have and what they can do with it there is also talk about one fc being bought by different uh, owners but uh, you know maybe we'll do you and i something called scoop and we start <laughs> absolutely well <laughs> you know. i think but that's an interesting thing about one championship i mean that is just a uh, um, a buy, uh, raise funds, exit strategy, uh, hopefully an IPO, and then you keep, it's, it's all paperwork. I think 1FC is a lot of paperwork, and um, they're really good at that. Uh, no, no doubt they're really good at that. Yeah, they, they convinced Forbes that they are the number two in the world. You know, At one point, I think three, four years ago, uh, Forbes magazine did uh, the biggest organizations based on revenue, I think, and they said UFC first, and they had 1FC second, and that's Forbes magazine, who does a lot of research. I used to be they're a uh, managing director, so they do a lot of research, but you're right, it's on paper. I also worked for 1FC, and I do think that, uh, you know, the model is different. Absolutely, and I, and, I, and I feel like the key thing is, uh, it's just that lack of understanding of MMA industry. I think today in the MMA world, nobody understands MMA, and it's a big statement that I'm making. I'm talking about the promot promotions. Nobody really understands MMA. They understand fighting. They understand the fight sports. Because it's moving. It's changing all the time. Absolutely. You know? Even the rules are changing. Even, you know, it's getting better, right? Don't you think it's getting better? They're, uh, I'm talking about the MMA industry. Sure. We have regulations at one point. When they Absolutely. Have regulations. Uh, there are some organizations, like I remember Desert Force decided to do something about the dehydration of the fighter. Absolutely. Uh, 1FC did after the death of one Chinese fighter. They end up changing the rules. Uh, uh, UFC started talking about five minutes uh, waiting for the eye poke after the DC and the John Jones fight. Uh, they changed the, their gloves and having them curved down more. Um, there's, you know, you talked about uh, Bellator having different gloves. You know, they're different from We've your, your gloves. We've changed our weight classes to 74 and 79. There you go. You guys instead of having super... Super light and super light welter just to cut that gap of... I thought it's because of Ahmed Laban, so he can win, you know. <laughs> <laughs> Which he did a great fight, by the way. Last yeah, I thought it was one of the most enjoyable fights. Absolutely. Just for, I know this off the record. A lot, of, but, lot yeah. of athletes, I believe that a lot of athletes, I, I'm one of the examples, you know, for that because I have a big lower body. My my, my, my uh, thighs, are, uh, when I used to fight, my thighs were like a tree trunk. Okay. Uh, it was all on my legs. It was on my thighs. It was on my calves and a lot of bone density. So when I go 77, 77, I look like a normal guy who looks uh, at 66 in you know in uh, the european world or the u.s yes, world yes. i look like because my upper body looks skinny mm -hmm. it's all on my lower body the, the the whole weight is there uh but then i'm looking at them like my upper body strength is not out there because of the lack of muscles and then i can i cannot go to 83 because that's too much you know and i'm like should i go to 71 i'll die you know and i had one of the biggest weight cuts that i almost went blind from one side of my eyes uh and uh, it was it was a crazy experience and i almost n sensed death you know and 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 for me i think the weight class have to be changed will you have a belt for that in bellator um, in, uh, in brave i'm sorry sure okay uh, who would be cuz i saw the fight between uh, carl booth i think i remember I, I came to bahrain just to watch that eldar eldar was a super Lever. lightweight champion uh, who Eldar Eldar, oh, okay, the okay. super li current super lightweight champion, okay. and uh, Jarrah was the super welter champion. Okay. So the weight classes uh, already existed. Uh, they, they, we have Jarrah as a champion. Uh, Abdul Abdul Ragimo was a champion. Eldar is super lightweight champion, uh, current super lightweight champion. So the, the weight class there, everybody's enjoying it. Uh, you still can go up and down much more easily. Sure. Uh, if you are 74 and you feel like you want to go to 71.5, why not? You know, there is a much more lesser gap than trying to go from 77 to 71. Plus, it's the protection of the or the safety of the fighters for their health, the way they, they cut and the, the hydration. You know, I think that that's a good. Plus, you know, in a way, it creates more champions. It gives you more pool of fighters, more more uh, defenses for the belts, which is I think a great idea. I think Absolutely. this should be open. I like even the idea of I would love for UFC to have super heavyweights. Yes, you know, even though they don't have that many heavyweights, but I think this is the you know how light heavyweight was the one to watch. I mean, Walter White lightweight is always going to be the one yeah. that's condensed, especially lightweight. But when you look at heavyweights. For the longest time, we had after DC, I think, Absolutely. and even DC was, you know, could have been light, light heavyweight, but Easily, he went to, yeah. to heavyweight. But because of King Velasquez was being there, and they're both friends. But if they create super heavyweight, then you'd get a lot of people, and people would enjoy those earthquake. Absolutely, know, I mean, hits. You know, when we had the IMMA of World Championships, uh, every time 
you would see the whole stadium so you, circling yes, around. World, when yeah. Pasha fights, we yeah. had one of our guys uh, from KHK. Uh, he's um, uh, he's the Dagestani Kung Fu Panda, uh, and he, <laughs> he looks like that. He walks, and you see him in the. Speaking of which, no, go ahead. Yeah, 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 yeah. So you see him in the backstage training area. Is he warming up? And we go back and we see him just trying to throw the bottle and trying to make it stand. You know, they do that stuff and he's yeah, just yeah. sitting on and just doing that. And we're like, what are you going to do? And he's like, okay, it's time to fight. He goes in, <laughs> boom, boom, jumps in one punch and everybody's going crazy, you know? And, and people love watching this. Love I'm telling you, these are when the screams happen and stuff. Uh, you brought Kung Fu Panda. I know we we're coming towards the end of the show. What do you think the message Kung Fu Panda is giving for kids? Here's someone that's very lazy, doesn't want to train, you know, comes in last minute. <laughs> versus, I'm sorry, he had a father and a dad. Okay, he was adopted. But versus one that was an orphan left in front of Sifu's house, little tiger, fit, did everything they want him to do. And eventually he's not the one. One kind of message I'm talking of <laughs> you're telling the kids you can be lazy and not disciplined, yet you can be Kung Fu and be cho the chosen one, you know. See, historically, I think cartoons have always uh, been uh, not the greatest messages. And we only realize it when we're older. Right, when we yes. look back, we're like, you know, I because uh, they I, were racist, they were like uh, sexist, they were a lot of things, you know. Only the, the, last week, I sat with my brother and we were talking, and I was like, you know, why I'm so fearing of hell is because of Tom and Jerry. In Tom and Jerry, there was a, there was a uh, episode where he was sleeping and he was dreaming actually, but he was going to hell. When, it, when the, the stairs come in. And oh my God, don't yes, remind yeah, me. Yeah, 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 yeah. Still, I'm getting the trauma oh, still. Yeah. But that was, uh, and imagine, now you realize that at that time you were just watching it and just freaking out and getting traumatized and uh, you never knew what was happening. But yeah, I think uh, cartoons are uh, a little crazy. I can't believe two of the biggest names in MMA were talking, discussing cartoons at this point. <laughs> <laughs> no, pleasure to be with you. I think we should have more talks on this. I think MMA is an interesting subject. We're part of it. I'd love to have more conversations, whether we're in Bahrain, Dubai, or even on Zoom uh, to educate more for the Middle East and mixed martial fans that uh, we have something great going on here. We have an industry of mixed martial. We have talents here. We have today the biggest uh, hot cake for sports investments in the Middle East and MMA has a big part to play in it. Uh, and I think the world of MMA wants to also target this region, whether you mentioned PFL, whether we spoke about one championship, whether we speak about UFC, which is already doing it. Uh, this is the future of combat sports, I feel, but I also feel like this place could lead uh, mixed martial art into becoming the apple. And I think uh, that's where we, we all should come together and look for what's bigger. Why should, if we can make that bigger change, why not? Why should we rely on the international organizations to come and help us change it while we have every resource that they need for us to make that change? And let's do it. Well, it was my pleasure sitting down, talking to you anytime, any 12 o'clock, midnight, three o'clock in the morning, give me a call and we can zoom it and we'll talk. Whether it's on camera, whether it's just a private conversation, always a pleasure. Thank you very much.